Good day. Today's topic is so important and has been, especially for the last 10 years, where it's been reinventing both igneous and metamorphic petrology. And what we're going to talk about today is diffusion. Again, my penmanship is going to get better as the lecture goes on. Um, in the text, 126 to 131 goes into this really nicely. And then there's another really good example in the textbook at pages 198 to 200, exploring thermal diffusion. All right, we sometimes call that conductivity. But this is a topic for diffusion. Thermodynamics tells us how a reaction should occur or not occur with negative Gibbs free energy. And diffusion is kind of like the kinetic limiter. It's going to tell us how fast that reaction can occur. So as we jump into the notes here, let's get a definition for diffusion. So Roman numeral one is going to be diffusion. And importantly, it's going to be our def definition, which I'm going to read to you. It's the random motion of particles in a system. The random motion of particles in a system. And a couple main facts about diffusion that we can just kind of list off here as we start is that it is going to occur in all materials above zero degrees uh, Kelvin. So everything all the time is experienced in diffusion. And the other thing about diffusion is that it equalizes concentration gradients. So that's going to be what we say here in A and B. So it occurs in all materials above zero degrees. Or let's say it this way, above absolute zero. And then we're going to also say here that the main concept of diffusion here is that we are going to equalize concentration gradients. Equalize concentration gradients. And I know you all have experience with diffusion, probably most commonly with smells, or sitting in the classroom, someone walks into the back of the classroom with pizza. It smells so good near the pizza, and we don't, the kids in the front of the classroom, don't find out till later, right? Because it takes time for that smell to waft across the classroom. The smell concentration gradient has to become equalized. And so we can draw this kind of behavior graphically, we're gonna do it right here, where our x-axis here is uh, position. Right, the front of the classroom versus the back of the classroom kind of deal. And then over here, we're going to have concentration. And to set up a concentration gradient, we need to have time 0, time 1, time 2, time 3 as things step through. And in this case, we're going to have a stepwise gradient. And so here, we have a very high concentration. And then on the other side of this kind of dividing middle line, we have a low concentration. A low concentration. And this is going to be all at time equals 0. This is the low concentration. How is this going to evolve through time? Well, we could probably do this with different colors. At the next time increment, what we're going to have, so let's see, we're going to have to go right through the middle here. We're going to, the concentration in the high side is going to start to fall, and it's going to start to increase the concentration on the other side. So that is going to be time equals one. And then we can have another time moment where this side is actually falling down a little bit, and it started to almost equalize, there's time equals two. And then eventually, after millions and millions of moments of time, years or seconds or milliseconds, we're going to get to at time equals infinity, everything has equalized. That is the evolution of a concentration gradient. Now, in geology, we could have a number of different environments. And let's draw and look at some of those environments right now. So let's say C here is going to be examples in geology. I thought of two of them right off the bat based on stuff we've talked about earlier in the semester. One, we could look at crystal zoning. This is fantastic evidence for diffusion. And we'll grab a photo here and throw it into the lecture. Oh, we got to move this around. It's too big. This is an amphibole crystal, right? 
you can see this amphibole crystal and if we were to look at the concentration going from the margin to the interior we could draw a graph of that and so here's our x it's our position here's our concentration of some major element or trace element i would say maybe it's low near the margin and then we see that big step right here that might have that might be what the concentration gradient looks like at time equals 0 and we can project what that would look like as time evolves. Let's see, we go up to another color, come down here, and, and after some amount of time, this is gonna start to increase, and this is gonna start to decrease, and we get some kind of profile like this. And if we let time proceed even further, we might get something, eventually, that has no gradient at all within the crystal. All right, there is one possible example. Now, here's another example. This is not looking now at chemical diffusion, but instead we can look at thermal diffusion, and this would be any kind of magma body. They are hot, and they are juxtaposed against colder environments. So let's do an example of a dike. So I got an image here. Oh yeah, this first image, by the way, is from Alex Streckheisen again. Good photo micrographs on his website. Here's an image of a dike I took from Wikipedia. Right, and we see that dike cutting through the country rock. We can think about the thermal evolution of this dike with the aid of diffusion. And here we have position x, and on the y-axis here we have temperature. And so on the margin of the, here's one dike wall, and here's the other dike wall, right? There's the dike wall, there's the dike wall. Here we have very cold country rock. Here's more cold country rock. And so it's cold, right, on the country rock. And then where the dike is, initially, these are going to be straight lines, which you can do crisply with your pencil. That would be our time naught. Uh -huh. But as time progresses, of course, the dike will cool and the country rock will heat. So the country rock will start to warm up. The dike will start to cool. Ooh, that's a very poorly drawn line. You do better, please. And we're going to let time continue to evolve. The country rock gets warmer, the dike gets colder, until eventually we could be in that situation where just the country rock is warmed up and the dike is completely cooled. That's not tech, this is not, this will put this one as time four. It's not technically time infinity, because as time infinity rolls around, this the whole system's just gonna get colder and colder, and eventually time infinity would be down here, right? But those are examples of gradients that are being equalized in nature. The mathematics behind diffusion is described by something called fixed laws of diffusion. So let's put here Roman numeral 2 and this is going to be fixed first law. He actually has two laws. Fixed first law. Uh, and you know what? Maybe we should have said laws of diffusion because really fixed law applies to concentrations. Chem chemistry, okay? And the same thing as fixed first law is something called Fourier's law when we're dealing with temperature. They're the exact same thing, and I'm going to show that to you right now. Um, so the equation for fixed first law is J equals minus D times change in concentration, change in distance. So what we have here, this is our concentration gradient. This, this big D sub I, that is our diffusivity. It's how fast the, the, the element I, like hydrogen, let's say, can move in a material. And then J, this stands for flux. And what we really mean by flux is the flow of atoms. Now, Fourier's law looks exactly like this, and it's for temperature changes. And so for it, what we have is dq, not Dairy Queen, but change in heat with change in time equals minus little baby k times dt over dx. All right. And this is very similar because what we have here now is we have the flow of heat that's an of, heat, is equal to the 
thermal conductivity, all right, that's what K is, it's thermal conductivity. And dT dx is our temperature gradient. Both of them, notice, have a little minus sign right here, minus symbol. There's a minus symbol, and there's a minus symbol. And that's just, I think, I like thinking about this as saying that we're smoothing out the ingredient. All right, we're flattening it, and that's why we have that minus K or the minus D. All right, so that's our mathematics to describe diffusion. Let's talk about some other things that control diffusion in the form of making it faster or making it slower. We're going to call this section diffusion rates. And there actually ends up being quite a few different parameters that can control how fast diffusion works. The units for diffusion, let's start with those. So let's go units. The units for diffusion are commonly meters squared per second. Okay? And so big values here might be like one meters squared per second. That's a fast diffuser. A common thing in a mineral mineral might be 10 to the minus 30. That would be a very slow diffuser. And there's big ranges. Let's talk about parameters that can control this. The most important of them might be temperature. Oh, and in fact, let's do it this way. Let's say higher temperature equals higher, come on, higher diffusion or diffusivity. So high diffusivity means fast. Right. And the way we usually show this kind of information is on a graph called an Arrhenius plot. Went, oh, that's a bad line right there. Okay, so here's, here's our graph. We have a, a, a y-axis that is minus log d with the units meter second per squared. Our x-axis, this is a weird one, and, and this, is, this is part of it being, there's the name of it, it's r... Uh oh, that's an N. Oh, I can erase. I don't want to erase because it costs me time, but we'll just erase the whole thing. All right, let's go back. R heinous graph. And the, the x axis is a weird one here. It is 10 to the fourth divided by temperature in Kelvin, which gives you these numbers that are really strange. 6, 8, 10, 12. And so, like, where is hot and where is cold? Well, because you're 10 to the 4th, the might by the temperature, this ends up being hot, and this ends up being cold. How cold? Well, it's a little tricky, but, like, this is, like, 600 degrees Celsius. Here's 800 degrees Celsius, 1,000 degrees Celsius, 1,200 degrees Celsius. Why do geochemists do this? I do not know. On the y-axis, this is fast diffusivity. Okay, I do know it because things plot really nicely in lines on the graph. But anyways, okay, so here's slow. And our numbers for this, we're going to put like, this is like 10. That would, that's fast. That means like 10 to the minus 10, right? And so here is uh, 10 to the minus 20. Here is 10 to the minus 30. And so when you plot something on this graph, you plot, so here's the Arrhenius relationship for like water fluids. This would be aqueous fluids kind of diffusivity. And so as we go to hotter temperatures, this end of the graph, we have faster diffusivities. That would be Arrhenius relationship demonstrating that higher temperatures are faster. Where do magmas plot? Well, magmas are kind of anywhere in this general range. We could say melts. <clears throat> and then minerals, those plot at slower diffusivities down here, maybe with a little bit of overlap with melts. This is where mineral diffusivity <clears throat> plots. And so you can see minerals are slower than melts. And so we can, from this graph alone, actually, we can come down here to number C, and we could say that um, viscosity has a control, or even solidity here, where higher viscosity of a material, higher density of a solid, so let's even put density down here, higher density or higher viscosity equals lower diffusivity. 
Okay, that's it. That's another control. And then there's just two more controls left. Uh, we'll drop them in. We'll drop them in right here. So D is atomic size. Can you guess what the relationship will be? Higher atomic size. That the radius. Well, the bigger they are, the harder it is for them to move, right? Because they have to fit through a lattice if this is a mineral. And so this is going to be lower diffusivity. And then E. Let's put that one in. This is going to be higher charge. So hydrogen is a 1 plus. Silicon is a 4 plus. The 4 plus is a higher charge. Higher charge means you have more bonds that are stronger. And so higher charge also equals to lower diffusivity. I can show you an example of this with a plot from the textbook. Let's move this down right here. And so what do we what do we see on this graph? Well, well first of all, it's our heinous plot, right? Where we have the weird units. Here's our diffusivity. So we have fast and we have slow. We have our temperatures. So this one is saying that sodium is a one plus charge with a radius of 1.39. So there's our radius, and then there's our charge. So let's see if this is right. Higher atomic size, lower diffusivity. This is saying that potassium is bigger than sodium, and it is slower than sodium. And so, yep, that checks out. Higher atomic size works. Now let's try this. Higher charge, lower diffusivity. We need to find two things here that have just about the same size. So barium and potassium. Notice their sizes are about the same. But barium has a charge that's twice as high. And notice how much further slower the diffusivity is. And so again, that checks out. The higher charge is slower with a lower diffusivity. Those are our main controls on <clears throat> how fast diffusion is. And so just to finish off the lecture now, you have all the theory. So now let's just finish off with application. And so this is going to be a section we call solving the diffusion equation. And you know what? In reality, solving the diffusion equation is really hard. It requires some calculus or even computer modeling. And so what we've done, what the community has done, is a lot of us you have a quick and dirty approach where we want to try to come up with a diffusion answer really fast without doing all the calculus. And so we call this, it's called the Einstein equation actually. And so we're going to write that down. We're going to go Einstein equation. And sometimes we call it the quick and dirty, the quick and dirty way to make the solution. And it's based on the units. So the units for diffusion were meters squared per second. And that allows us to make this jump, which is we didn't come up with. Einstein did. And it is, I'm talking about that Einstein, right? The genius Einstein. So he says that the way, best way to solve diffusion is by looking at the units and saying that diffusion is equal to distance squared divided by t, where we could rearrange that if we wanted to and solve for different variables, because oftentimes we know diffusivity, so but we don't know t or we don't know x. So we could rearrange that to be t equals x squared over d. Or if we wanted to solve for x, we could say that x equals square root of dt. And generally speaking, this is what textbooks often quote at you as the diffusion equation, but all of these are totally fine, depending on your purpose. Let's do one example in practice, and I'll make you do another one on a test, and I'll make you do another one kind of on a little mini homework. But here will be our first example that we do together, and we're going to ask the question of how far will potassium K plus diffuse in a rhyolite did I spell that wrong? I did. Rhyolite in one million years. That's the question. We got to figure that out. And you need to be given the diffusivity. The diffusivity of potassium in rhyolite is going to be 10 to the minus 12 meters squared per second. So to set this up, we are trying to find a distance. So I think x squared root dt is best, so we have x equals square root of dt, 
x equals square root of 10 to the minus 12 meter second per squared times 1 million years. Units here are seconds, units here are years, so we need to uh, take this one step further and go x equals, this is going to be a while, 10 to the minus 12 meters second per, meter squared per second times 1 million years times 365 days per year times 24 hours hours per day times 60 seconds per minute times nope 60 minutes per hour times 60 seconds per minute we multiply all that through and what do you get check my math but I got 5.6 meters and that is it that's the end of diffusion you've learned what you need to learn Take a look at the textbook. It is pages 126 to 131, 198 to 200 for some good worked examples and for another point of view.